The Royal Horticultural Society has been at the forefront of British gardening for more than 200 years. Best known for staging the world's most famous and prestigious flower show, Chelsea, it has four showcase gardens up and down the country. And in 2017, the RHS embarked on a fifth garden. One of the most ambitious and challenging garden projects the UK has ever seen. This is by far and away the biggest project and the biggest budget that I've ever managed. I mean, it's off the Richter scale. Their plan, to transform a neglected Grand Victorian estate in Greater Manchester into a world-class garden. I think the North West really deserves this sort of attention. In this series, we go behind the scenes. So it means in terms of how these walls are built, we're working to the millimetre. With unique access to the crack team of designers, engineers. There we go. Oh. That's it, there you go. Look at that! Gardeners and even pigs. Rent a pig. You need your garden turning over, rent a pig. Tasked with taking on this colossal multi-million pound construction project, we'll witness the huge challenges they face. If we were climbing Everest and it's, what, 30,000 feet, I reckon what we're at. But we're at base camp, I think. Base camp. <laughs> <laughs> to create one of the biggest gardens in Europe. In a constant battle with the British climate. We're kind of breaking the rules a little bit. We shouldn't really be planting in the soil this stamp. And how they cope with a global pandemic only six months before the garden's grand opening. This is the story of Britain's biggest garden build, RHS Bridgewater. The story of Bridgewater started more than 180 years ago. Here in Worsley, Salford, Greater Manchester, there once stood a magnificent Victorian manor house, Worsley New Hall, designed and built for the first Earl of Ellesmere, a man who made his fortune from coal and the canal network that fed the Industrial Revolution. The house is now long gone, but industrial archaeologist Dr Mike Novell has been keeping an eye on and surveying the site for more than 10 years. This is where the house used to be, up, up on that top terrace, and we're looking at a, a really a magnificent structure, a huge building with fantastic views out over into the North Cheshire Plain. And it's, it's a building built to impress. So it's a building that says that the Earl of Ellesmere has arrived. And the landscape is designed to frame the hall. And then we've got the staff running the gardens. So we've got head gardener running that side of the estate. And he's got between uh, a dozen and 20 people. And they're running the kitchen garden. And they're also running the glass houses. And they're maintaining the landscape behind us. As with many large estates, Worsley Newhall fell into decline. The Grand House finally succumbed to a fire and was demolished in the 1940s. The estate was then left to the ravages of nature. It's January 2018, and to realise the vision of reviving this grand old site, a top team has been assembled. One of the key people is the curator, someone with an incredible passion and knowledge of gardening, plants and landscapes, Marcus Chilton Jones. So we're in the inner walled garden now, which is the heart of the Bridgewater estate. It's part of a series of walled gardens that encompass 11.3 acres in total. Now the garden we're in at the moment is about one and three quarter acres or thereabouts. And in its heyday would have been the real centerpiece of the site and ultimately will be the centerpiece of this new garden. Along this back wall over here was a series of vineries. There was a peach house at one end all of the back wall is heated with flues and you can see the chimney that was put up at the back there from the 1840s. All of the walls would have been clad in fruit, getting protection from the frost to ensure that there was a really good crop for the table of the Ellesmeres. When the RHS announced their plans for Bridgewater, I quite simply had to apply for the role here the scale of the ambition that the organisation has for the site, 
the involvement of some world-class designers, and the possibility of making a real difference for the future of gardening generations was just too good an opportunity to miss. So the section of garden that we're leaving behind us is an ornamental garden to be designed by Tom Stewart Smith, whereas the section of garden that we're entering now is being designed by Charlotte Harris and Hugo Bug, and it will showcase fruit, vegetables and herbs. Much of the ground hasn't been touched for decades, and there's a nasty legacy the Victorians have left behind. Marcus, is it true there's arsenic on site? <laughs> you bugger. <laughs> um, in Victorian times, they used um, arsenic as a, as a pesticide, so they sprayed the hell out of loads of things. If it crept or crawled, they zapped it, and quite often with arsenic. And they've done that all through the late Victorian period, right up until about 1930. Consequently, there are a few trace elements of that which we need to remove. <laughs> as well as the 11 acres of walled garden, the ghosts of those that worked here can still be felt all around this 154-acre site. There's the old gardener's bothy, the garden cottage, an extensive woodland, and a magnificent ornamental lake that was the Earl of Ellesmere's pride and joy. So this is about looking picturesque. It's about controlling the landscape, controlling nature, but there's also another function to it as well. And that is in the winter when it would freeze over. And so you could then get some poor barrow boy to come down here, dig out the ice and take it up to the ice house. So it has a practical function. And I suppose there's a third element to this as well. We know that the Prince of Wales in the late 19th century is coming up here for the shooting. And obviously, with a nice expanse of water like this, it encourages your wildfowl in. Obviously, they're, they're rearing pheasants, of course, as well. Above all else, the family would be most familiar with the lake, looking out of the window of the hall at the top of that hill as a vista. The person who is now in overall charge of delivering Bridgewater and the team that will transform this unloved estate into a thing of beauty is Sue Biggs, Director General of the RHS. Bridgewater is massively important to us at the RHS, partly because it's the first time we've ever had a garden up in the northwest, but also because it's a new way for us to really engage with people living in cities. There's less and less green space for people, and really important they come to the garden, enjoy that green space and that world-class horticulture. Then add to it that Salford and Manchester are in such easy striking distance and it was a very easy choice for us to make. One of Sue's key decisions was to find a designer with the vision to take Bridgewater into the next phase of its life. Tom Stewart Smith is a world-renowned landscape architect who has won three Best in Shows and eight gold medals at the Chelsea Flower Show and designed important gardens that appear all over the globe. When I got the call. It was incredibly exciting and I knew that the RHS's intentions for it would be on a pretty meaty scale. The first thoughts were dictated by decisions about the location of the Vista building and what are people's first experience as they, as they arrive at the garden. And a very, very early idea was this idea that we, we would make a new lake that would connect via a long stream garden to the existing lake which would form, in the long term, the spine of the garden. Because we have to remember that, you know, the, the bridge water we're seeing in the next five years, let's say, is only really kind of half the garden. And there's this amazing site up there, which, you know, we just, just don't have the scope to get engaged with. The, the wall garden was always going to be the sort of jewel in the crown of, of bridge water. And I thought that the main space here should be devoted to vegetable growing. Um, which in some ways, you know, recapitulates the historic use of the, of the wall garden, but, in a, but it was always going to be in a, in a contemporary way. But the centre of the garden, which is actually the only part of the garden surrounded by four high walls, should be this idea of the paradise garden. It's the oldest typology of gardens we have, dating from, you know, 500 BC. And some people think, you know, gardens are English things or, or European things. Well, they're not. So I, th I based the design of the garden on a Persian paradise garden. The central part of the garden is based exclusively on American plants, and the eastern part of the garden is based on European Mediterranean plants. 
it's very much not going to be a restoration of a garden. I think that um, neither anybody in the RHS or myself had any doubt about that. It's spring 2018, and work finally gets going. Roughly the size of 10 football pitches and with a mile of historic walls, the jewel in the crown of Bridgewater is going to be the walled gardens. From a distance, the walls that will be the backdrop to the gardens and plants look wonderfully rustic and quaint. Get close up and they need some attention. So over a few months, a team of specialist bricklayers, laborers and builders are going to transform these rustic walls into rustic walls that are just a bit tidier and safer. You think laying bricks is laying bricks, but it's not quite the same here. We're actually having to rebuild sections of walls that have got previous bellies in. They're totally out of plumb, which is out of line. And it's a lot of sympathetic brickwork rather than looking, looking to a spirit level or a string line. This will eventually be a huge garden and it will need a big workforce to maintain and run it. Marcus has a skeleton garden team already, but he needs to add to that group as the project develops. Today, he's looking to recruit four more entry-level candidates and he's lined up a series of practical tests for them. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to RHS Bridgewater, probably the most exciting place to be in horticulture in the UK. So today's a really big day for us. It's a recruitment day. We're looking to bring on board four new horticulturalists at an entry-level job. So we've got a full day of activities. Some of them are going to be building towers out of marshmallows and spaghetti. Some other ones are going to be out uh, knocking back rhododendrons. We've got a machinery test. We've got a plant ident. And, of course, there's a bit of health and safety thrown in there as well. So your job for today is to do some crown lifting of this tree here. <laughs> I would go to about here. OK. And I'd do, I'd do an undercut yep. and then I cut on top. To me, this is like blank canvas. It's the, the perfect building job. I really think it's a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with something on this scale. Check tyre pressure. It really doesn't matter what their personality's like. It's more about their approach to work and how they work with other people that's the key. There's a lot of really good, really talented people here, so who knows? Do you think you've got them all right? Um, I've, not all of them, but, yeah, a bit rusty, but, yeah. The last two years, I've heard about Bridgewater, and it would be... It's the goal, really. There's so much going to be going on here, and a lot of work involved, and all the different aspects of it. It'd just be amazing. I have always liked gardening. I used to garden a lot when I was younger with my dad. Thank you. <laughs> When I heard about it being done up, I just thought, I need to get a job there. Uh, and luckily enough, I did do. And couldn't stop grinning for weeks. As well as a gardening team, Bridgewater will need a gang of arborists to maintain and manage the hundreds of trees. Team leader Josh Corbett is looking for a fully qualified tree surgeon. Michael McCann is being assessed by Josh and hoping to impress. I'm a local lad from Little Alton. To tell you the truth, and I never really, obviously before I started the tree surgery game, I never really used to take much time to, to appreciate trees. But uh, over the last 10 years, I've, uh, yeah, I've started to grow to become, as you'd probably call it, a bit of a tree hugger. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say that anyway. How's he getting on? Do you think he was nervous at the start? Yeah. Yeah, I do, yeah. 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 And he does seem to have calmed down now. It's, it's, so it's good to good. Yeah. Yeah. So the higher he gets, the more confident he gets. <laughs> <That's> pretty <laughs> much. Yeah. 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 I mean, it can be fun at times. It can also be quite tiring. But generally, a lot of the time, it's quite exhilarating, to tell you the truth. And you get a lot of, you know, me time up there to think. And, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice. Fingers crossed. The grand ornamental lake is suffering from years of neglect and needs some drastic attention. 
John Pye has the huge responsibility of managing all the construction work on the entire site. And the lake is presenting a new challenge. So this is one of the very first phases of work here at Bridgewater. Um, the key thing for us is to get the water out of the lake. We don't do this on a regular basis. This is unique to, to Bridgewater. I came uh, for an interview here on site and we went for a walk on the edge of dusk and it was just such a, an enchanting place. And to be shown the master plan uh, just got me so excited about what role I could play in delivering this project in such a, a, a fantastically tight time scale, but one that personally I think was a, a real professional challenge. One challenge John has is that he can't drain a drop of water from the lake until he gets the go-ahead from a team of environmental consultants. So we've had a walk around the uh, perimeter of the lake itself, just to inspect it to see if there's any evidence of any wildlife, such as waterfowl and otter. There is no record of the site having those species. The experts have given the thumbs up, so John now has the go-ahead to switch on the pumps. We've got 40, 50 years of silt that we've, we've got to work through. We don't know what we're going to find when we, when we dredge the lake. And if we don't start it this soon in the whole project, um, we won't have the lake ready and refilled and looking pretty for 2020. Now the plug has been pulled, it will take a week or so for all of the water to disappear. Bridgewater will be an opportunity for people to showcase their talent on a grand scale. Landscape designers Charlotte Harris and Hugo Bogg were chosen to transform this daunting two-acre site into a new kitchen garden. I think what, what we love doing when we make gardens is thinking about the stories around each garden or landscape. And for us, what immediately drew us was you see perhaps just on that southern extent, there's a bund with the Bridgewater Canal moving along there, canal boats floating along there. Um, and that felt like an absolutely defining story for this garden. The amazing thing about the Bridgewater Canal is it really generated the development of Manchester within the Industrial Revolution. And we felt that was such an amazing and important story of heritage and place. We wanted to bring that into the garden. So what we've done was we looked at um, the networks of the Bridgewater Canal and we extracted part of it. And then what we've done is abstracted that and that becomes some of the path networks within this garden. In its prime, this grand estate was so important that it was visited twice by Queen Victoria. The royal visit was celebrated by the Earl of Ellesmere. He commissioned a special royal barge which arrived via the Bridgewater Canal, and legend has it that he dyed the water blue for Her Majesty. The visitors will have an option to you know, walk along the walls or go down that diagonal route, which is the canal network that we were talking about. Hugo and Charlotte are going to need a blank canvas or patch of mud to work on but they can't get started until Marcus solves that arsenic problem. Cue the bulldozers. This phase of the project is the bit I've really, really been looking forward to. We're on the edge of the kitchen garden. It's day one in terms of the soil shifting. So we've started moving all of the topsoil out of the garden. And that dumper in the background is just getting rid of everything. So this is a big day for us. We've been planning it for months, years, actually. We need to move the soil for a number of reasons. The top garden, the Paradise Garden, was a garden centre for years. So that area needs stripping of all the stone build-up that there's been in there. The area immediately behind us that's going to be the kitchen garden historically was a kitchen garden. And unfortunately, there's been a build-up of chemicals, but we now need to remove all the soil from it so that we can grow edible crops on it again. All of the soil out of the kitchen garden is going into the Paradise Garden because we're not growing edible crops in there, we're growing in ornamentals. And then the soil that's to go in the kitchen garden is coming from the new car park that we're building. So there's a lot of Robin Peter to pay Paul going on around site. Whilst the bulldozers do what they do best, the team here are turning to more subtle methods to help clear and manage the other areas of the site. Believe it or not, with pigs. The staff are going to introduce six Berkshire piglets to Bridgewater. So they've gone to a pig school for a day to learn about pig psychology, behaviour and handling. They um, are being used more and more now for conservation products where they are actually using to clear ground in a natural way. Using a pig 
is undoubtedly more efficient than using a human being. They can keep going all day, every day. Giving pigs a health check probably wasn't in the job description, and administering drugs certainly wasn't. But it's all for the good of the pigs. OK, you've got the big one, so just nicely there. Put the needle in and then you're going to need to hold like it that. quite... Yeah, straight in. That's it. Because she's, she's a big girl. She's a very big girl. To try and get the girth, <laughs> I tried to get both hands round her and that was... She's like a big barrel. <laughs> but she's lovely. They're going to be clearing the ground for us where the archer's going to be, so... They'll be situated there for a while in different oh, areas cool. and doing the hard work for us, yeah. I can imagine they're going to be absolutely spoilt rotten by all, all the staff, all the volunteers. Everyone's very excited for them to arrive. Oh, well done, girls! It's early 2019 and Bridgewater is now a major construction site and quagmire. And a key build is about to get underway. One of the first experiences visitors will have is the Welcome Building, and Gareth Davis is the project manager, responsible for building the architect's vision. We commenced the work on the new Welcome Building. We're currently uh, driving some concrete piles in to support the actual structure of the building. The ground in the area here is particularly poor, and what we have to do is find some good ground below to find the concrete piles which is why some of them are going in at 9 metres, some potentially go down at 12 metres. As a new building begins, the Earl of Ellesmere's pride and joy, the old ornamental lake, is finally drained. And some heavyweight machinery moves in to dig out decades of silt. After a week of machines playing on the lake bed, all of the silt has been removed. And Michael, who got the job, is part of the arborist team working to tackle the neglected trees that surround the lake. Josh Corbett is overseeing the work. We're working on the north edge of the uh, old Victorian lake today. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, restore the old vistas, and we're also trying to create the space for the, on the lake edge for the engineers to get in and do any renovation work they need. It's spring 2019, and the build is moving along at a pace. The walls are nearly finished, the brand spanking new welcome building is underway, and the pigs have settled in regardless of the noisy neighbours. There's not a plant in sight, but the vision of Bridgewater is emerging from the mud of the walled gardens. Having spent so long just looking at drawings in the office, at consultants, at the RHS head office, and now to see it actually taking shape, and it, it just looks exactly like those drawings, that is fantastic. We have a, a mile of historic garden walls um, which we're well on with repairing. We're going to uh, lay down over five miles of paths um, in and around the wall garden and beyond. We've got at least 100 uh, contractors working on site right now, uh, so the scale of it is, is really enormous and it's snowballing as more and more activities take place on site. When building a garden on this scale, there are some very big decisions to make. But today, for John and Marcus, the devil is in the detail when it comes to the surface for the paths. In terms of picking from the beauty parade which one is going to be the winner, we got it down to this final suite. And the one that was chosen as a front runner, after a little bit of debate, took about five minutes, was this one here. So this was the final decision. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen here. You know, you've got a lot of different designers, you've got a, little, a lot of different directors, you've got a lot of different staff and invariably not absolutely everybody's ideas align perfectly all of the time. They just don't. But everyone's on board with this one. We're comfortable that this is fit for purpose, suits the place, and everyone is happy with it as well. So we're in the right place, but we've got a hell of a lot to do. You know, if we were climbing Everest and it's, what, 30,000 feet, I reckon what we're at. We're at base camp, I think. Base camp. <laughs> 
Someone who's left base camp for the day is garden manager Tracy Snell. She's in charge of the woodlands. Plants are being sourced from all around the UK and Europe. Trace is in North Wales to visit Colin Mugridge, who's making a very generous gesture. Colin's kind of donating some of his collection to us at Bridgewater for our woodlands. Colin used to fly fast jets for the RAF, but since retiring, his passion has been growing rhododendrons from cuttings and seeds. He now has a huge collection and has bred many new varieties, which he grows in every nook and cranny of his garden. This is a loderi rhododendron called King George. Simple cross produces a magnificent flowering plant, which is one of the great flowering plants of the world. It's a beautiful thing, and it'll grow much, much larger than this. That's why it's very important for my hybrids to go to Bridgewater, where they've got the space to grow. Just the passion that it's taken, one person, it's amazing. He's got pots everywhere. He's got pots behind his garage, and his allotment patch. There's no, there's no room for broccoli or cabbages. It's all rhododendrons. It's really quite special that we're going to get to keep a record of his life's work at Bridgewater. I'm getting old, I'm not in the best of health, and I'd like to see them go to a good home. And hopefully at Bridgewater, they'll be able to look after them and they'll give pleasure, hopefully, to, to many people. Nice to see you. <laughs> and you hope... Lovely to see you. And you too, and we look forward to seeing you uh, yeah, next week. Yeah, hopefully next week, yes. Good. The build at the moment is in a really interesting phase. It's super busy. There's workmen absolutely everywhere. When the sun's shining, everything ticks along fairly well. When the rain comes in, which we've had, certainly last week, it makes life a bit tricky across the board. So we really are hostage to the weather a lot of the time. Oblivious to all this commotion are the pigs, who, as their expanding waistlines will testify, have done a magnificent job of clearing the ground where a new orchard is to be planted. Now we're moving into a new spot further into the woodland. Um, so there's been a lot of preparation, a lot of planning. So today we're doing a pig drive from here all the way round the Bothy and up into the woodland to get them in the new area. Now, the pigs are going to put Katie and Carolyn's handling skills that they learnt at pig school to the test. There's been an awful lot of planning we've done over the last few weeks, um, what route to take, um, getting them to follow mine and Katie's voices. I love getting up in the morning, coming to work. Just everything about it. We love the digging, the clearing, the planning, researching the plants that we'll be using. Um, and the people we work with, everybody's so nice here. We're a great team. Yay! So, what's not to like about it? That went really well. It went better as expected, I think, yes. I think the plan is to be here about 12 months, but uh, they may turn it over quicker than that, so we'll have to see. They're probably thinking, oh, where are we? It's paradise. As the pigs settle into their newfound paradise, the Bridgewater team have a challenge on their hands developing their own paradise. There's a shortfall in the budget of nearly five million pounds. A big press event has been organized in order to raise vital funding to keep the project going. And DG Sue Biggs has been called in to help spread the word. The whole cost for the opening budget is 30 million, so we, we've already got all of that but 4.8 million. So, of course, it's a lot of money, but this is a very large and very beautiful garden, so we've got the ambition and we believe we will be able to fundraise that. Gardening personality Carol Klein is an ambassador for the project. Her grandfather worked on the old estate, so its revival means a lot to her. It's quite a few months since I was here last, and the difference is just astonishing. And the scale, you know, I mean, it's a huge civil engineering project before it's anything else. But the way it's all been thought out and actually being put into action, I just, I just think it's amazing. 
I think the North West really deserves this sort of attention, you know. It's about time. We've been following this story now for about four years, and it's not just the kudos that's going to come to Salford, it's the potential that it can bring for education and the well-being of the local community. That's what interests me. You know, Salford kids coming out here. From the tour that I've had today, it will be geared to that. And I really hope it doesn't become an elitist day out for people. It's, they've got to stick to the commitment to make sure that local people benefit from it as well. There were some Labour councillors who actually voted against this when it went to full council because of the potential additions to the traffic problems. Plus, I mean, Salford Council has got an anti-pollution policy and what are we bringing here? Potentially thousands and thousands of cars. I spoke to a councillor myself and he said to me, he said, well, and at the moment, Salford Council are scratching around having to cut services. Now, it's a tough call. Personally, I, I think this is worth it. But um, questions have been raised. The City Council has contributed around £19 million to that acquiring the land, also doing some of the highways works outside of the garden and obviously supporting the on-site work that's actually happening here. In terms of whether or not this represents value for money ultimately, um, this is capital money, so it's not money the City Council can use for jobs and services. And this is about the economic impact in Salford, but also in Greater Manchester and in the North more generally. Ultimately, I don't think you can wholly put a price on the value we'll be creating through RHS Bridgewater. The team are on a big PR drive, and to get the message across to the gardening public, there's no better shop window than the greatest flower show on earth, Chelsea. So in 2019, they built a garden to showcase their new ambitious project. Quite a task to demonstrate a flavour of 154 acres on a plot of just 200 square metres. Tracy Snell is responsible for spreading the word to the Chelsea crowd. Everybody coming here gets a snapshot of the welcome experience that you get at Bridgewater. It's a real chance to say, look, this is next year what you're going to experience. It's the largest garden project in Europe, and this is a taster of what's to come. I think it's wonderful that the RHS are going to have a place for people to go in Manchester. And I just think any green space that people can use and enjoy is just a great thing, really. These large space frames that come through, those are coming back on a very large lorry. When the show is over, this entire garden will be driven up the M6 to Bridgewater and not a petal will be wasted. One week later, and all the plants from the Chelsea Show Garden arrive at their new home. That's the fourth lorry load of plants this week. So is that 11,000? 11,000 11, right? plants. I keep getting it week. wrong. Yes. Yeah. 11,000 plants, unloaded, checked, put into groups, counted, labelled, potted. If they've potted, in pots, so they won't arrive in pots. And work. then we started to plant some out. I'm just putting these plants back in their pots. Some have arrived without any pots. Uh, the sooner we get them in here, the more comfortable they'll become. And um, hopefully we won't lose any. Um, they've done really well. They've travelled and they're still alive. And, yeah, we'll keep it going. It's been quite hard as gardeners to not be gardening. Because um, yeah. a lot of the work we're doing is still clearance work, you know. It's nice to... Well, have beds and just start be able to fill them and, and, yeah. and soil starting to go in. It's yeah. nice to be at that stage and now. And planning what's going where. We're getting plans now of what's going where, what's due to come in and when. Yes. And How many thousand do you even do? Well, yeah, personally, <laughs> I think I'll do at least 3,000 myself. As the glamour of Chelsea fades and the year moves on, so do the walled gardens and work on the centrepiece of the Paradise Garden, the water feature, begins. 
Laura Birkin is the project engineer who is overseeing a critical stage in its construction. What's happening here is the concrete walls for the central Paradise Garden water feature are being poured. The slab was poured a few weeks ago and the walls are now going in with some quite accurate formwork. It looks as though maybe the just pouring the concrete out of a bucket isn't particularly accurate. But we've got to design this water feature such that it fits exactly 14 by 28 off-the-shelf porcelain tiles on. The intention is that we have no cuts, so the tiles just slot in neatly. So it means in terms of how these walls are built, we're working to the millimetre. All of the things below ground that help us to grow the plants are going in now. That will be done by midsummer, at which point it's time to bring the soil in and start thinking about planting in the autumn. Autumn is a long way off, but that's not bothering the pigs. Six weeks ago, they were moved to the woodlands, and Katie and Richard are keen to see how much they've cleared. They've done a fantastic job in here already. You can clearly see all the, uh, the brambles and everything they've cleared. So, yeah, they're doing a really good job. The Berkshire pigs are very low impact on the, on the soil compaction. Strimmers wouldn't really get the roots of the weeds that we're after, uh, especially around the tree roots, which is, is what we're looking for in here. So they can, they can rummage through and unearth the ground, eat the weeds, um, which is exactly what we want, really. Rent a pig. You need your garden turning over, rent a pig. While the sows get on with turning the ground over, it's a big moment for Gareth and the welcome building. The roof is going on. This building is going to be the first glimpse of Bridgewater that visitors will have for years to come. So it has to be perfect. This is the second lift of the timber structure onto the main roof. I think this is a significant milestone in the construction phase, particularly with all the planning and the design and the meetings that have gone on over the last 22 weeks. To see this now coming to site, being fabricated and landed on the concrete columns, uh, really exciting. When it's manufactured in Germany, they work to extremely tight tolerances. When it's delivered all the way here and fabricated together, they very kindly give us a tolerance of five millimeters, which is particularly tight in construction terms. In some instances, if they're so far out of tolerance in the concrete columns, then the only option is take the concrete column down and then that really does cause a problem. It's an anxious time for Gareth as he waits for the thumbs up from his team. There we are, and she's on. Happy. Happy. While one milestone is passed, another gets underway. An epic dig starts next to the Welcome Building. Bridgewater is getting a new lake. The Earl of Ellesmere's original lake would have been dug by hand by hundreds of labourers and a lot of hard slog. How times have changed. The new lake is being created by powerful machinery and a handful of workers. Project engineer Laura is in charge. In terms of what's going on behind us, we're just digging the new lake next to the welcome building. So as that starts, it's just a huge excavation of about eight and a half thousand metres cubed of soil. We're building a new lake here because part of the master plan that was done by Tom Stewart Smith means that the old lake was linked to a house that is no longer there. So it's about bringing the attention down to the welcome building and down to what we're doing next to the walled garden. So, so far, no sleepless nights on the lake. We've got diggers moving, things are happening on site. There is a hole where there didn't used to be a hole. So, so far, everything's OK. The garden opening is a long way off but the team are planning well ahead and have already started sourcing plants. All right. Oh, lovely. <laughs> With all the works on track, Marcus is taking a break from the giant building site. He's down on the south coast to visit a nursery to cast his critical eye over what he hopes are some very impressive specimens destined for Bridgewater. So we've got some encouraging signs on this one, haven't we? Yes, exactly, yeah. Beautiful stems on them, though. they're amazing. Nice, aren't they? They're really going to look good, good in position. Yeah. There's a lot of white fly on it. Yeah, that's only come in the last couple of weeks. And you can see there's no, there's no um, fly in here. It's, it's on the edge, as opposed to in this area. Yeah, it's, it's not as much. <laughs> oh, on that side, is it? Yeah, yeah look, I can see it moving around. So we've got 
on the nursery at the moment, we've got these big beach columns. It's 30 odd of them. We've got some smaller beach domes as well. So this is the, the glue plant for site, if you like. It's something that repeats right across Bridgewater. And you'll have these beehives and columns and the parotias at the back dotted all through the site. All this section here looks fantastic. Fantastic, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Some of them we got a problem with. Some are a bit slower. Well, there's dead, there's dying back in them. Yeah, we've shock. Got some pest. Yeah. Um, we've got a dead tree. So we've got over 80 plants in here, some real whoppers, some jumbo, you know, four metre plus plants. It's coming in at between about 60 and 70,000 pounds, which is actually quite good value for money. So the average cost per plant is somewhere between seven and 800 pounds. Um, it's a lot of money, but the garden's a big investment, and these really get, will give this place a sense of scale, maturity, right from the off, which is really important. Otherwise, we'll have this wonderful garden with all these amazing walls and all of these features that we put in a new glass housing and whiz-bang, you know, um, ponds and so forth, but then we'll have tiny little plants. So you really need to get some, some big elements in around the garden, and I'm pleased that we've, uh, we've chosen to invest in some of these. As the workload at Bridgewater grows, so does the number of people working here. Sylvia Travers has been appointed as team leader of the Inner Walled Garden and reports directly to Marcus. I took this job because it was a new challenge and, to be honest, I don't think I would have joined the RHS had it not been building a new garden. So the fact it's a new garden was the biggest draw. We're getting to the tail end of it now where um, the contractors are trying to move out and finish and snag and we're working around them and we're getting close to deadlines. We're losing our, our season of actually getting on the soil. Um, so we're getting a bit frustrated. We just want to get stuff done before Christmas. I understand that they need to be here and need to finish, but we just want them gone now in the nicest possible way. Gareth and the contractors building the Welcome Centre and the New Lake won't be leaving for a while, as there is still a vast amount to do. Marcus is taking time out from horticulture to see how the build is progressing. It's not often you get the chance to walk in the bottom of a lake. So, oh, there we go. Whoa. That's it, there you go. That's like, that's the, that's the, uh, Oh. The hydrostatic pressure underneath the, uh, underneath the membrane. Look at that! Hydrostatic pressure is a technical term for water trapped under the lake lining. And there's nothing for Marcus to worry about. Will this go pop and we just disappear? No, 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 no we're fine. This this will come all the way up. Don't worry, don't worry about that, we'll be OK. <laughs> I'm glad it's glad it's reacting like this to give you the, the sensation. Well, I'm glad we came down here now. But that is freaky, there's... isn't it? It's really cool. It's like walking on a waterbed. Being down here is brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's an unusual opportunity, isn't it, to come in the bottom of a lake. Uh, I haven't done it before. I'm not sure I'll do it again. So just to get the depth, the sense of scale, just a completely different perspective. So at one we're, point... a, we're about two, two, two and a bit metres uh, of water. So this is the, we're in the lowest point of the lake. So it's going to be up there. Two metres high, yeah. yeah. The next stop on the site tour is the Welcome Building. So this will all be tables and chairs, tables people and sitting chairs, around. Yeah, OK, area. got it. Here. I mean, you must be so pleased that when these massive pieces of timber arrive, that they end up perfectly going onto those pillars that are sticking up and all the bolts line up and everything works. I'm sure it ain't as easy as that. It's not, and it's testimony to the, the site team and, yeah. and the, the, the efforts that they put in to make sure that they are in the right place, because if they're not, we're, we've got a big problem. You know, I've, I've seen the drawings talking about the cathedral-esque pillars and yeah. the celebration yeah. of the roof and the way the two things will work together and the larch and all yeah. the rest of it. But to actually stand here, it's super impressive to it be is, under. Yeah. Yeah, it it's is. got massive wow factor, hasn't it? I think everybody that sees it, you know, has, has, has got to be impressed by the, 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 the actual structure and what's yeah. gone up there. Everything's coming together and, and I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. All of these meetings have sat through in London, in Manchester. To actually see them translated in the flesh, into a building, into gardens, into lakes, through people working energetically left, right and centre is brilliant. The garden team, the horticultural team, are working in really difficult circumstances. Most people who come into the horticultural industry do so because they like working with plants. And obviously, generally, at the moment, our guys aren't doing that. They're sat in a building site 
we're clearing the soil and we're going to be doing a lot of work that just doesn't entail any work with plants at all for about a year. So in terms of how you manage a horticultural team in those circumstances, we're having plant therapy days every quarter. And for a bit of plant therapy, some of the team are off to a nursery for a monumental green fix. I'm here to get excited and very scared by 25,000 plants coming for the Paradise Garden. It's, it's really nice to see the stock of it, you know, finally after all these sort of nearly a year. It's becoming very real all of a sudden. This is Prescaria taurus, and it's a really healthy plant because it's got loads of shoots coming from the bottom, you can see. It's nice and dense, nice, healthy green shoots. And the thing I'm most concerned about is looking at the roots. So there's a very nice, healthy root system here. There's some new white roots. If we get this plant in, in the next couple of weeks, it'll have a good month, six weeks growing time. I'm really quite excited about uh, this arbutus here. A nice, interesting, slightly different albuter strawberry tree. This is a European fan palm, so it's going to grow into uh, the Mediterranean area in the wall garden. Maybe it's slightly unusual to see, you know, an exotic palm up in uh, the northwest of England. I think that's, that's something people will spot. You know, we've got the world here almost. So, yeah, fantastic a range of plants. The team are happy with the quality and range of plants. All they need now is a home. The gardeners are working at full pelt to get the beds ready for the thousands of plants that will eventually fill the walled gardens. Meanwhile, Hugo and Charlotte, designers of the kitchen garden, are paying a visit to get a unique perspective of their design, which is based on the Bridgewater Canal and the surrounding network. It's so amazing being able to see it from this bird's eye view because um, usually when we're here on site, we're wandering through the garden, but actually being elevated, you can really see the layout. You can walk along the sort of main canal pathway, as we call it, but actually just seeing it from on high and then seeing how those field networks knit in, it's just, it's just amazing to see it from this angle, really. I think it's a shame that um, the public won't be have this kind of bird's eye view because it is really amazing to see not only how the garden space looks at that height, but also how it connects to Tom's garden and the other gardens surrounding it. But I guess at the end of the day, gardens are places to be immersed in and to walk through and smell and feel and touch, just really enjoying the experience of being inside them, really. It's September 2019 and a landmark moment as some key plants arrive. A landmark moment needs an impressive plant. These giant ewes should do the trick, and there's a truckload of them. After two and a half years of toiling on a building site, Michael and the garden team are getting excited. This is uh, what we've been working towards, so it's obviously quite nice to be able to uh, put in something, some stock lattice, especially, you know, especially this size. But it was never going to be as simple as digging a big hole and plonking them in. The main sort of challenges that, that we have of this time of year is the weather, you know, and obviously with the scale of the planting that we've got involved in and stuff like that, you know, we're, we're doing stuff probably at the back end of the wrong time of year, but it's got to be done. Getting them in the holes can be quite difficult and off the pallets. You can see the movement in, inside the U itself, you know, you can see it's not really a sturdy stem, it's multiple stems and they're all quite, you know, on their own. So you start trying to move any of them with any force, they'll snap break, then you lose the shape of the crown. So it's a knock-on effect then, you know, so we want to try and be as gentle and as uh, precise with these as possible. Right. We're just going to try and see if we can lift one side of the rhubarb to try and slide underneath it with the forks and then obviously try and put it into, into the hole then. So then the last thing we want to do is start stabbing the rhubarb, because once you lose the structure of the rhubarb, it starts falling away. Then, obviously, it just makes it harder to level up then. It's a heavy uh, clay content as well, which obviously makes it hard for the water to drain away. So we, we, these are all things we have to take into account when planting stuff like this, because these won't really sit well in a lot of water. With each ewe costing hundreds of pounds and being signature plants, 
the team can't afford to get their planting wrong. Marcus has arrived and is concerned that the ground is not good enough for these precious specimens. So you're still hitting the green clay, so you might just, it'll just gather all it. James. <laughs> still think you want a little bit of something underneath it. Because it's just going to sit on water, isn't it? And cold as well, isn't it? You know, we had a bit of a thinking time about it. You know, there was a few standing moments and looking at the holes and trying to see what was the best way to do it. We're going to take out 150 mil more, leave it on a bed of sand, and hopefully just watch and see how it drains that way. So now we're just uh, basically going to take a bit of time to obviously prep these beds a bit more. It slowed us down a little bit, what we didn't want really, but yeah, this is part and parcel of the job now, you know, especially with the ground changing so much, so. While the team and the ewes retreat to fight another day, the welcome building reaches another defining moment. We've reached another important milestone uh, on the project. Um, we are installing uh, 110 sections of uh, glass that's just been imported from Germany on the central roof lights of the main building. Uh, it's extremely important for us to get the building weather tight now, particularly with the weather we've uh, encountered over the last few weeks in Salford. And I'm pleased to say that they are going in as expected. <laughs> as the welcome building takes shape, the arborist team are back again for another shot at getting the precious yew domes planted. The ground is still very wet and boggy, but they need to get these in as they are a key feature of the garden and any delay will hold up the rest of the planting. We've just got our first yew taper in. Uh, it took a little bit longer than expected because once we dug down, we hit clay. So uh, what we've had to do is tap into the nearest land drain, um, bring the levels up a little bit with some, some gravel and then manage to just get the, the root ball in. So we're back filling the pit now and that'll be done. To get the yews in probably took around a week. Very much a team effort, so yeah, happy. We managed to get them all in without causing any damage at all, so, that, so that was really nice, you know. The last thing we want to be doing is damaging trees before they end up being planted. And they look perfect. Oh, they're really nice, then. I like them. You know, I'm, I'm helping, you know, create a garden that's beautiful, you know, and I can't wait for it to obviously be open. When the garden eventually opens and visitors make their way through the welcome building, Along with the ewes, the first thing that will catch their eye will be the huge space frames that featured in the Chelsea show garden. The metal work that they're bringing in gets placed over this main, what we're going to call, long walk that runs up from the welcome building up into the heart of the garden. I think I made the mistake of, of asking Tom what the finished colour was. And I, I, I just regret that day, because in our industry, red oxide is sort of an undercoat. Um, so, yeah, he didn't speak to me for a while after that. There will be plenty of other colour to admire in this garden. And after a year of frustration for Sylvia, she and her team start to get the hundreds of thousands of plants into the ground that will be admired for years to come. We started on the Paradise Garden. That was our first area of planting because it was ready with soil in. It's been quite intense in the sense that there's uh, 25,000 plants in that garden. It's a pretty epic moment in a way because it's the, it's the first bit of planting in the whole garden. And in many ways, it's the most difficult bit. It's the East Paradise Garden. So most of it's European Mediterranean, but it's sort of quite a broad concept. So it includes South African plants and going sort of east a little bit into Asia. What we don't want in this garden is a very hard winter. Because there are quite a lot of plants here and they won't be very happy. That's a cracker, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's a filaria, so it's a Mediterranean tree. When everything else is sort of a bit floppy and flimsy all around, this thing sort of sits there like a rock. With Tom, he's, he's very um, easy in the sense that he's, he's very clear that he trusts that w what we do and how we do things and our ability, and he's been quite hands-off. He's made it sort of very clear that there's certain areas he wants influence in, which is fine, um, but mostly he's left us to plant and to use our own judgment as to how to implement his planting plan. We're now on the eastern garden on one of the walls, which is a, one of the biggest beds in the Paradise Garden. There are a lot of plants in here. We did a delivery of 5,000 yesterday for this bed and also for the central area of the Paradise. It's a serious period of planting for the team 
as every plant needs to be in the ground well before the real cold and wet of winter arrives. And just as they get into their stride, their worst fears are realised. The weather turns against them. When it comes to the horticulture, that's when it gets a real challenge if we get uh, really inclement weather. We're kind of breaking the rules a little bit. We shouldn't really be planting in soil this damp, but we've got a schedule to stick to. We need to get it in sometime, and if we leave it so it's ideal, we won't be open in time. So. If it's raining five days a week and you're out there planting, and it all gets a bit difficult and, and you're covered in mud. And I think that is going to be the big challenge. You know, let's hope that we don't get too wet a winter because it's going to be pretty tough for everybody if it, if it is. We've got so used to seeing soil and, and paths and nothing else. Uh, and now we're, we're being seduced by this prospect next spring of colour and leaf and height. We'll have glass houses by then. We'll have water features and it's just going to look amazing. This is by far and away the biggest project and the biggest budget that I've ever managed. I mean, it's off the Richter scale in terms of size. The attention to detail and the pressure on making a mistake is ramped up that much higher. It's February 2020 and down at RHS HQ in London, there's a big press announcement about to be made. We've heard on the grapevine that they're going to announce when Bridgewater's going to be open. It's been uh, three years of uh, tense times waiting for Bridgewater to get the final nod that we're going to open. It's been a long haul for the team. And finally, after a brief presentation to the media, DG Sue Biggs announces the moment they've all been waiting for. So we are going to announce today that we're going to open the garden on Thursday, the 30th of July this year. Now the date for the opening is set, Will the team get Bridgewater finished in time? The question of whether we'll get everything done by that deadline is a tricky one. We will certainly get enough done that we can open and the place will look amazing. We've actually got a focus now. We have so many things still to do. A long, long way to go yet. We've got to make the deadline. There's no, there's no um, maybes. The weather will be a key determining factor in that. If we stay at the wet end of the spectrum that we've been at up until this point in time, we're going to have to drop a few bits off the end. Next time. As the excitement of the press announcement fades, the team have a huge challenge and just five months to get the garden ready for their first visitors. Little did anyone know that unprecedented times were looming that would not only have a serious impact on the plans for Bridgewater, but also for people across the globe. Tonight at six, the biggest one-day increase in the number of people infected with the coronavirus in the UK. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. As the crisis unfolds, we'll see what impact the pandemic had on the team and the building of Bridgewater. Hey, 
Yes, 